so uh, Giovanni and I are going to be doing a kind of a tag team, and he's starting off. Um, Giovanni is the city engineer um, and what, graduated from Yale, actually, once upon a time. Um, he uh, was hired under the previous mayor, and he's still here today, so he must be doing a good job. Uh, and in fact, I can speak from my own experience that uh, Giovanni in engineering at, in New Haven has been a fantastic partner with us in the various projects that we've been working on. This one, Coastal Resilience, a bunch of things. So really happy to have him here. He's going to be talking kind of about uh, the siting design issues, and then I'm going to follow up with some information about uh, the, the monitoring that we've been doing and the results from that. So Giovanni. Thank you very much. All right, so we're here to talk about our downtown bioswill project, and we'll talk about green stormwater infrastructure and our, uh, the way we're attacking climate resiliency in New Haven in general. I want to say a big thank you to Colleen Murphy Dunning and to Gabe Benoit for inviting me here today. Uh, it's always fun to come back uh, to campus and talk. Um, I did not go to FES, although Dawn Henning, who also does a lot of work on this in the engineering department, did. Uh, but it, it, you know you have a beautiful space here, and it's wonderful to come and share some of our results. All right, um, maybe this will work. All right, so when we look at um, climate change in New Haven, very briefly, you guys are all very familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, some of the effects that we're going to see in New Haven is high higher sea levels. Uh, which is a big deal, especially if you have a, a business or something else in this area, for example, down on Long Wharf. Um, the official State of Connecticut forecast, which I'm sure all of you have heard by now, is up to 20 inches of uh, sea level rise by 2050. Um, this is higher than the, uh, the, the global average because of various uh, sort of local features uh, in the northeastern part of the United States. Um, I can't pretend to actually be able to explain those coherently, so I will defer to our good friends at Yukon Circa for that. But this is a very substantial number. Uh, you know, New Haven already ha suffers from, uh, you know, coastal flooding and other coastal driven issues, uh, and this will make it just that much worse. Uh, the second impact is more rain. Here you have a screenshot from uh, a WTNH story uh, not too long ago. Uh, this is the corner of George and Temple Street, and you see the nice spontaneous water features that uh, have uh, developed here in the roadway. Um, that's something that we see, especially when there's a high tide. Um, you know, high intensity, short duration events are sort of becoming a new normal here in New Haven. Um, you know, when, when a lot of our stormwater system was designed, uh, we had lower water levels out in the harbor. We also had uh, uh, lower predicted uh, events. So we use the NOAA Atlas 14 to predict uh, the size of rain events uh, over a certain return frequency. Um, and each time they revise, uh, uh, NOAA revises its official predictions, we see those, uh, you know, a particular, you know, five-year storm or a 10-year storm, that storm gets bigger. Um, and finally, we expect to see more extreme weather. This is Long Wharf uh, during Hurricane Irene. Um, and uh, that's another uh, thing we expect to see from uh, climate change. So altogether, they also have an additive effect. Higher water out in the harbor means we can drain our city less effectively. More rain means that there's more water to drain. And that adds together to create a lot more flooding. Um, this isn't flooding sort of by the beach. This is right in front of our train station, for example. So very important areas and areas that uh, are vital to uh, New Haven's economy in the way that people get around and also our, our big safety concerns. Uh, note that we're trying to block the road right here, but that doesn't prevent everyone from driving around through the floodwaters. Do not drive through flooded streets, please. I've seen a lot of stuck vehicles uh, because of that. All right, so when we talk about downtown itself, downtown is probably our largest single drainage area in the city. We have 260 something uh, drainage areas. A lot of those are very small. Uh, downtown is very large. It is uh, 835 acres. Um, it is mostly separated, although uh, the sort of the nasty secret in separated areas is that there's still a lot of combined uh, water going into the sanitary sewer uh, because it's hard to fully separate all the buildings in the area. 
Um, also, there are a few areas like down in here that are still combined. Uh, we have two outfalls and a very complicated stormwater system. Uh, and also this is compounded by the history of New Haven. So this is an old map. Um, I wish I knew off the top of my head when this was done. It was done uh, you know, before the highway was put in. So uh, when the highway was put in, they filled in about 200 acres of Long Wharf. Uh, the rail yard was right on the water. Um, Long Wharf Pier actually went all the way back to the intersection of uh, roughly State and Water Street. Uh, some of the historians in the crowd can probably correct me on that. Um, and so this is a very large and sort of flat expanse here that we have to get all the water from downtown across without much topography to provide a slope for our pipes. So this results in a very large and complicated stormwater system. Uh, mostly the takeaway from this slide is that it is uh, a rather complicated system. We actually have a ring in this system and depending on the exact conditions out in the field, we have water flowing in all sorts of different ways around that ring, um, which makes analysis very complicated. Uh, we also have not a whole lot of, again, not a whole lot of height in the land. So you, you look at normal high tides, probably about what? Elevation three and a half or so. A really high tide is a little over elevation four. Uh, Brewery Street extension right over in here, uh, you know, on the other side of Ikea is uh, only about a foot, foot and a half above that. And, um, you know, Union Avenue and Route 34 are only, uh, you know, five, uh, five feet or so, four or five feet above that even. And you have thousands of feet of pipe before uh, in order to drain all that out. So um, we end up having a very flat drainage system. Uh, and rising waters out in the harbor that prevent the water from flowing out. All right, and so this is sort of a schematic of what we have. We have a lot of, uh, you know, storm rainfall falling on the upper reaches of our storm sewer system. It tries to go out. There's a pinch point right here at the rail yard and sort of a very flat pipe to get out. We have storm surge and high tide that prevents the water from getting out in the harbor. And what ends up happening is water... Uh, you know, sort of what I call a spontaneous detention system occurring out uh, on either side of the rail yard, commonly known as flooding. All right, so to give you an example of this, we have some real-time uh, water level uh, instrumentation in our stormwater system. Um, this is uh, a manhole actually right near Ikea on Brewery Street. Uh, we actually had installed it, I think, two days before we this event happened here on the 22nd or 23rd, uh, I was sick at home, so I got to sit at my computer and watch it happen in real time. And sure enough, we got a nice big spike here, and you see these other uh, spikes in the water level in our storm sewer system. And, um, you know, so the pipe is a, is a pretty substantial pipe. I think it's a uh, four and a half foot pipe. Um, this is the level of our manhole, and as you can see, the water levels are above our manhole. And sure enough, uh, during this event here, uh, this is what the area looks like. Um, our manhole is, uh, I believe, somewhere over in here, uh, under nine inches of water. So it's always nice to see that your instrumentation is working correctly. Too bad it's in a big flood. So, yes, so um, our solution is really a, a green first stormwater infrastructure uh, solution. And uh, this is a, a picture of one of uh, my favorite bioswales downtown, right across from Claire's. Um, so we looked at, at green stormwater infrastructure. In New Haven right now, we've got 204 installations of green stormwater infrastructure in the public right-of-way. Um, and they're uh, sort of, a lot of them are in downtown, and then a bunch are in the West River area. And then there are other projects that have scattered sort of throughout the city um, as we manage different stormwater problems. Uh, so as we try to build resiliency, especially for downtown, we realize that gray stormwater infrastructure really isn't the, the only way or even the preferred way of taking care of the issue. Uh, oops. So we uh, emphasize green stormwater infrastructure, all of these bioswales, in the upper reaches of our storm sewer shed so that we would eliminate water from our stormwater system uh, as much as possible, even before it enters the, the pipe, so that uh, we wouldn't have to 
spend as much on upgrades to the pipe uh, going forward. However, um, in the future, because of storm, uh, storm surge and sea level rise out in the harbor, there are going to be times when we simply can't drain parts of downtown, and that will require a very substantial pumping station in order to get water out of downtown in very large uh, storm events. However, the green stormwater infrastructure does a lot to reduce the necessary size of that um, pumping station. All right, so the bioswale design that we used, uh, we actually based it on New York City's design. Here's a very nice rendering that they have. Um, it's, uh, it basically involves a curb cut uh, that brings water preferentially into a planted pit that is uh, at the side of the road in between the sidewalk and the street. Um, it has two feet of uh, an engineered uh, soil uh, and then a, about two and a half feet of a uh, very, like a three quarter inch stone rock bed, uh, which serves as a reservoir for water to then infiltrate into uh, the ground. New Haven has very sandy soils, so we see very high infiltration rates. Um, for example, the state of Connecticut says that the maximum infiltration rate you should consider when designing stormwater infiltration is five inches an hour. Uh, five inches an hour is actually a very bad site in most of New Haven. We typically see um, infiltration rates anywhere from about 10 inches an hour to uh, 140 or more inches an hour, uh, which means you can basically pour water on the ground and it just disappears, uh, which is very useful when you're trying to do green stormwater infrastructure. Um, so some schematic designs of what, uh, you know, our, our standard details, which you can get off of our website on our bioswales. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of trial and error in trying to figure out what sort of design works in a uh, dense urban environment. And we've settled on uh, some refinements of the, the rendering you just saw. Uh, one of the things we did was we eliminated the, um, uh, one of the two curb cuts. Uh, we realized that basically by having another curb cut over here right before uh, it goes to a catch basin would actually reduce the uh, capacity of the bioswale uh, to hold water during uh, very, very uh, heavy rain events. Um, so we'd sort of preferentially create some ponding on the surface that goes away very quickly uh, after the rain subsides a little bit. Um, another thing we do is we put granite curb all the way around and that pro provides a very strong hard edge to the bioswale. Um, it's a material that's very common in our, in our downtown area for all of our curbs um, and also uh, prevents, you know, when, when people are using sidewalk clearing machines or things like that from destroying our bioswales. And then we have a very simple um, post and chain fence, uh, which is easy to install, does not require things to be very dimensionally accurate when you're putting them in um, and, and makes for a much easier installation process. Uh, in section view, uh, the bioswales, um, again, have sort of two feet of engineered soil on top, plants. We actually have ended up not putting trees in any of our bioswales, uh, even though initially we were planning on doing so. We found a lot of the locations that we were going to put bioswales weren't really suitable for trees. Uh, also, the, um, uh, you know, it, it just got to be a lot easier to just put in smaller plants and they work better. We often have to put these in between existing trees, so uh, it really wouldn't be uh, suitable for more trees. Um, one of the big things that we do that actually comes from the New York uh, City design is we have a stone gabion, uh, kind of a mesh box that's filled with, very, with large stone, and that serves sort of as a short circuit path down in for water from the surface down into the stone bed. So if we have leaf matter or, um, you know, just a lot of water rushing into the bioswale that prevents the water from all seeping through the engineered soil, it can kind of quickly go down into this rock layer, be stored, and then um, infiltrate down into the soil. One of the nice things we like about our design is that we use a standard footprint of five feet by 15 feet, and you'll see most of our bioswales are about that, but it's very easy to modify the design. Um, here you have one that actually has two inlets because we have a catch basin right in the middle of it. 
Um, this one is uh, a lot shorter, and this one is kind of an almost square uh, setup there. So it's very easy to change it dimensionally. As long as the major features are located somewhere in the bias whale, it's pretty easy to construct and still works. So one of the things we found out that is not just what we build, but how we build it that's very important. Um, we want to make sure that the construction jobs are accessible for residents. So we've partnered with uh, the Urban Resources Initiative and Emerge, which is a local nonprofit that works with the ex-offender community uh, to provide job skills training and work um, to build these bioswales. Uh, and this also provides an entry for people entering the work for the construction workforce uh, to then get jobs in New Haven's construction boom. You've seen all of the construction going on around the city. Uh, those are you know, very desirable jobs. Uh, and this is a way to provide construction experience uh, for people to then go in and find uh, other, other jobs throughout the construction workforce. One of the key things that we did in Bioswales is we actually do a lot of the work manually. So that is a, a, our labor cost is higher, but we don't have as much equipment out on the street. And that actually saves a lot of money for uh, the maintenance and protection of traffic. Uh, in downtown, footprint of construction is so important and can drive a lot of costs. And so by having you know, hand digging, for example, uh, the bioswales really reduces the quantity of, uh, of footprint that the construction activity takes uh, and makes for a safer uh, construction zone for everybody. Some lessons that we learned is uh, first we have to always choose green stormwater infrastructure as the first option. This isn't sort of some side pilot project. It's actually the first thing that we always go to whenever we have a drainage issue uh, in the city of New Haven. Um, we, you know, in academia, you're not supposed to steal from other people. Uh, we, in government, we do that all the time. Um, and it works very well. So we take stuff from other people around the country. Uh, we want to build and maximize the co-benefits. Having a green landscape in our city is very important, has a lot of benefits. Also, how we construct is so important, making sure that uh, our residents and our communities are involved in the construction. Um, one of the other things is that we get a lot of questions about bioswales, so we've been putting up signs in them and trying to educate the public about what they are, what they do. Uh, and actually, we've gotten a lot of people that uh, wouldn't be classically interested, perhaps, in stormwater infrastructure that are requesting these in front of their houses and things like that, uh, which then means we have to usually explain to them why their house is you know, at the high point in a road or something like that, and we can't put one in front of their house, but they're more than happy to put one down the street. Um, and the other thing is to be flexible and adaptive. Uh, every bioswale installation is a little bit different, uh, even though we try to make them as cookie cutter as possible. Sometimes you just have to cut your losses and abandon the site. Um, you know, sometimes you have to really adjust the size of what you're trying to do. Uh, one of the sort of I think neglected parts of green stormwater infrastructure is the dry well. It doesn't have quite the flare of a bioswale or something that's planted, but it does have many benefits of infiltrating water into the ground. So we, uh, we sometimes will opt for that in order to still uh, get the benefits. Um, and the other thing is really play to the strengths of, of green stormwater infrastructure. You can't really use it at the end of a pipe. You have to use it at the start and capture as much water in a distributed fashion. Uh, one of the other things we do is that you know when private developers come in uh, to redevelop in New Haven, they have to follow our, our stormwater ordinance. Um, and I think having the bioswales all over the city uh, really provides visual evidence that these sorts of techniques actually work. And with that, Thank you very much. If you want to, uh, you can follow, you can send me an email, follow us on Twitter. Uh, we have internships. We're starting up the Climate Emergency Task Force. If any of you are interested in being part of that, uh, go to newhavenct.gov, find the boards and commissions page, and then fill out a little form. Uh, and you can be, uh, apply to be a member of our Climate Emergency Task Force, where we talk about this and many other things. Great. Well, thanks, Giovanni. And I think it'll make the most sense for us to uh, do all of the questions at the end. We're right on time here. Okay. Just to have a...
supposed to have an option here to put on the other computer. It's not showing the, uh, the laptop as an option. There it is. Great. It's always surprising when I fix a tech problem. <laughs> okay. Um. Showing it on my computer, but not on the screen. So far, so good. Okay, so um, Giovanni really set the context there very nicely, and what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the monitoring that we've been doing. So we've been installing these things. We expect them to work, uh, but there's not a lot of research out there that shows that they do work, even if like in a very simple-minded way, they ought to work, right? So we've been doing uh, research in three different systems. I'm going to be very quickly describe uh, our study, shite, study sites and then talk a little bit about the methods because as a researcher, um, I, I can't resist doing that. And then I'm going to tell you about the results and conclusions that we found. And the bottom line, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the punchline at the beginning, they work very well. OK, so these are uh, three sites that uh, we studied. Um, mainly, I'm going to be talking about the downtown sites that uh, Giovanni was describing, but we started sort of at a smaller scale looking at uh, a neighborhood over near Edgewood Park on West Park uh, Avenue, and then also up on the northern edge of the city at Daisy Street. And um, <clears throat> so the first project that we did had sort of like the, the real gold standard for research, which is that you have a treatment and a control, and, and, and the, the two should be as similar as possible, and in the control you have no intervention, and in the treatment you do. Uh, Giovanni just mentioned the cisterns or dry wells, and our treatment actually had uh, seven installed bioswales in the northern portion, but in the southern portion it relied on a cistern, which is just a big underground chamber that allows water to infiltrate into soil, so you get the same benefits uh, below ground and you don't see it at the surface. So you, you give up that uh, people seeing it and caring about it and knowing about it a little bit, but you, you get a lot of the same um, water treatment. Uh, our, our research design um, for all the, the work that we did uh, compared watersheds, and in some cases, well, in, in this one case, we were able to have a control and a treatment, and most of the others were merely comparing multiple uh, 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 watersheds so that N doesn't equal one, it equals uh, two or three in some cases. Uh, we look at what the system behaves like before the installation and then afterwards. However, the weather could be changing, and that's why it's nice to have the control and the treatment. So you follow the control from year to year and see whether it's changing, and that tells you whether the treatment might be changing for those same external factors. And we also look at different scales. So we look at the entirety of the, of the watershed. We go to the point where the water is leaving the system, and we look at the aggregated effect of everything in the watershed, but we also like to zoom in a little bit and look at individual bioswales whenever we can. Turns out that, surprisingly perhaps, measuring individual systems is pretty, pretty complicated and difficult. Um, the second site was up in the north. We zoomed in. We looked at tiny little watersheds with only a half dozen to a dozen houses on them, um, but there's things you can do in these more detailed, smaller scale studies that you can on the larger ones. And then finally, I don't want to show this right now, we'll come back to it. Sorry, um, there's the downtown area. <clears throat> and this is uh, a uh, cookie cutter taken out of that <coughs> much bigger citywide uh, slide that, that Giovanni showed you. And it's looking at the two uh, relatively large sewer sheds that we looked at. Here's the scale. This is a kilometer across. And you can see all of these little green dots are implementations of bioswales on one watershed that was centered on Elm Street and a second one that's centered on Chapel Street. And I'll come back and talk about uh, some more of the uh, installation and implementation issues later on. But this is the big one, and the idea is, okay, you've seen what happens in a, say, a, a one-block kind of area. What happens when you zoom out to a significant portion of the city? 
Um, and there's different scales that we, we come to. I, I talked about the individual bioswale versus the whole watershed, but also depending on the size of your watershed, you may be uh, passing all of your water through relatively small pipes or really big ones that you could probably drive a smart car in, in, in the biggest pipe that we, we've been working in. Um, doing this research also means you get to go into the subsurface, do a little spelunking in the city. Um, and there's uh, Colleen uh, taking a photo of me going down uh, in the West Park area, sorry, yeah, in West Park. Uh, and then shout out to two students, Kevin Doms and Kelsey Samrod, two master's students here who have both graduated and, and did very significant work on two of the projects. Now, um, Giovanni was sort of emphasizing the flooding uh, question, and because of that, you want to know about water flows. But water flows are important for a second reason, which is related to water quality, right? You can go out, take a sample, see the concentration of stuff, but if the concentration, if the concentration's high and the flow is low, it's not a big deal. If concentration's high and flow is high, then that is a big deal. And so uh, we were measuring water quality, but we were also measuring water quantity. And we did that in a variety of different ways, depending on the application. We put in these special uh, V-notch weirs, and then all you have to do is measure water depth, or in this case, sewage depth. It's pretty disgusting down there. Um, and from that one number, you can get a, a, an easy to measure uh, a parameter like just water depth. You can get flow amounts. We have these kind of high-tech uh, Doppler flow meters. Uh, we had these kind of funny Rube Goldberg tipping bucket systems that worked very well. They fill and they tip, and each tip counts uh, a given volume of water. And we also tried some things with these little mini flumes uh, to try to uh, measure the amount of water that's coming down the gutter and getting into a bioswell. So we had uh, multiple different methods depending on the kind of system that we were trying to measure. Skip that. Okay, um, as I mentioned, we measured water quality and it's not enough to go out and grab a sample because if, as I'll show you in a minute, as we look what happens as a storm comes through, Sometimes during the storm, concentrations are especially high, and at other points in the storm, they're low. And so you've got to measure multiple times during the storm. And, <clears throat> and unless you want to force your student to sit out there for 12 or 24 hours, we use these automated systems, um, these samplers, where you have multiple bottles in a little carousel, and a kind of a robotic arm comes around that you can program and take, uh, uh, take, collect samples for you. Let me bring it back to the lab and use kind of state-of-the-art methods to do the analyses. We're largely interested in um, nutrients because of problems downstream like uh, hypoxia in Long Island Sound, but also toxics. So we use uh, metals often as our uh, representative toxin. So this is something I was a little bit wondering about. Uh, the downtown installation on Chapel and Elm Street, uh, these instrument boxes have to sit there all the time, and I was afraid that they would get vandalized, and in fact, they never did over the course of um, the better part of two years, which really surprised and impressed me. Um, and we also would put out these, uh, these are the auto samplers with the lids on, with the bottles inside. Um, <clears throat> and I thought those might be um, molested as well, but it turns out, I think they look too much like a garbage can for people to really care about them, and so they, uh, those only had to be out for, say, a day, but often it was overnight when you couldn't guard them in any way. They were never bothered at all. Okay, so, well, sorry. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to do is sort of check my methods, and so uh, in this deployment in a sewer, um, I took all of the data that was being collected of water depth, right, in this V-notch from which we can get flow, and I aligned everything uh, many days, probably 100 or more days, all of the measurements that we did. And what we found was something that you might expect, and that's reassuring, which is that at night, water levels are low, flows are low. And then in the morning, they spike up. People are getting up, brushing their teeth, taking showers and so forth, using a lot of water. It's a little bit lower in the daytime, high in the evening, and it drops off after that. And so the, the uh, results from the measurements are kind of what you'd expect. And these are very subtle measurements that we're making. We're, we're looking at variations in water depth of only a centimeter, and we're still getting results which we, uh, give us confidence. 
Okay, so as I said before, you want the uh, control and the treatment to be very similar to each other. Uh, this is just water depth, and I've offset these so that you can see them better, so the scales aren't the same on the two axes. But as you can see, the pattern of uh, water depth and consequently water flow are exactly the same. And if you plot one against the other, do a so-called uh, scatter plot and look at the regression, it's, it's excellent, right? So um, I think we wouldn't argue that the treatment and the control are behaving very similarly, which is exactly the goal. <clears throat> and this is in the pre-installation phase of the project. So we did this before measurements in both systems. Um, and you can also look at individual storms. And here's one uh, showing calculated discharge. The gray bars, I don't know if they're easy to see or not, but that's rainfall that came through and caused an increase in flow in both systems. They're not exactly the same in terms of their total size, so that the slope of that line wasn't quite one, but they both you know, peak at about the same size, same time. The, the, the pattern of flow is kind of similar to the so-called storm hydrograph over the course of the storm. So everything is behaving the way that we expect before installation. After installation, things also behave more or less the way that we expect. And here, <clears throat> the thing to, to, I would emphasize are the bluish dots, which are the control. So that's the system. We've done nothing to it, and it's receiving rainwater. But then the treatment system are these uh, triangles, these purplish triangles, and they're much lower. Right? So a lot of the water is being intercepted by the bioswills that we built and by the cisterns and entering the, the, groundwater, the soils in the groundwater system rather than getting in the pipes and causing flooding downstream that we might be worried about. Um, and the nice thing is we weren't only just looking at the difference between the two, we also have the green line which represents the direct measurement of water flowing into the bioswales and into the cisterns. And so the, the, the whole thing uh, adds up. We, we get a so-called mass balance where all of the, the inputs for the two systems are exactly, well, are the same within the air. And you know, this is a huge effect, right? Um, <clears throat> even when you look at the bioswales alone and don't consider the cisterns, two thirds of the water in this, in this neighborhood is being captured by the bioswales. They're working very well. Um, we also, as I said, looked at water quality using uh, copper or metal as a representative of toxicity. And again, huge decrease, something like 90% difference between the two. And that's happening for two reasons. One is you're removing water from the system. It's going into the groundwater. It's not going uh, downstream. That's good. But there's also some removal process that actually takes place within the bioswell itself. Now, um, one thing that didn't turn out quite the way we expected was that water passes through these systems so quickly that they don't have a lot of time to, to do the removal process. So removal was a bit, little bit lower than I thought it might be, but still, um, this is looking at uh, measurements within a bioswale. So here, <coughs> we measured water that's in, flowing in the gutter, and we looked at water at the bottom of the bioswale and looked at the difference, and there you see um, a relatively small 15% difference between those two. But that doesn't matter too much because the water is then not going into a pipe, but going into the, the groundwater soil system and receiving additional treatment. What happens in the soils? A lot of things. And if you were taking my introductory environmental chemistry course, I'd give you a lecture or two explaining all this stuff. But needless, just, let's just say there's a lot of things that happen in the subsurface that cause um, reduction in pollutant loads. So, um, people often say, well, isn't, aren't you just polluting the, the groundwater instead? And the answer is, um, there may be some degradation of groundwater, but largely you're getting uh, the, all of this free treatment. And that's the whole point of this green infrastructure, is to use nature or mimic natural effects to get low cost, low energy use uh, treatment. Um, West Park. Um, I'll end up pretty quickly, so we have some time for questions. But um, we also looked at nitrogen, and there's removal there as well. But numbers are kind of similar in patterns uh, like the, the toxic. So let's not spend a lot of time on that. Um, in the Daisy neighborhood, um, same kind of results. This is an individual storm event. And what we're seeing is the amount of water 
that comes during one storm, uh, adding up and up and up and up, and this is in a pre-implementation system. And then the red line is the same system after we add the bioswales. And what you find, whoops, what you find is lower amounts afterwards. And in fact, if we take many different storms, so this is the slide we just saw, and that whole black line and the whole red line convert into just two points. So we're talking about a lot of data here. Uh, and what you see is that pre-implementation, a lot of water is being delivered to the downstream piping system. And after the rain event, uh, sorry, after implementation, much less water is going down uh, downstream in the pipes. It's all getting into the subsurface. So this looks good, right? Yeah. Um, one thing I want to mention is scale again. So on these units of cubic meters, we're at 80. In a couple of slides, I'll show you uh, a much, the much larger downtown system. Uh, everything doesn't always work out, though. This is a plot just like the one we just saw. This is another in that same neighborhood. In both cases, you get this big decrease. But the third one didn't behave properly. And we're still kind of puzzling over that a little bit. Uh, we think that we just don't really understand the way the system is literally plumbed rooftops and water uh, being kind of diverted in ways that are happening in the subsurface and that we can't actually uh, see above ground. Um, so these are the two that behaved the way we expected. And here's the surprise. And sometimes these surprising contrary results give you uh, insights that you wouldn't have if everything behaved as expected. Right? Um, water quality, typical results. Again, we have this thing that pre-implementation, higher levels, and this is in the case of solids, uh, post-implementation, much lower values. So we've seen uh, essentially two things here. One is much less water uh, is going into the storm drain system because much more of it is being captured by the bioswales, but also the water quality is also being improved at the same time. So we're having success in, in both of those dimensions. Uh, similar results for nitrogen. Nitrogen is a lot more complicated because there's a lot of different kinds of processes that can occur in a bioswale. Uh, nitrogen fixation, denitrification, uptake, a lot more stuff than is likely to happen with a metal. And so we get some results that are unexpected. So it doesn't always go down. I mean, it does often. But in some cases, we see even increases uh, in the bioswales because of the set of biogeochemical processes that are taking place. We're still puzzling over this a little bit, but um, it's not necessarily a terrible thing. Whoops. Uh, finally, uh, downtown. Um, we had not a control and a treatment, but two large systems, so n equals 2 for this. And what we're seeing is uh, for Chapel Street, um, sorry, giving, away, giving this away. For Chapel Street, uh, flow is, and, and the green bars represent rainfall, uh, and water depth is the blue. And what happens is that when you have a, a rainstorm, um, water level rises the amount of flow increases, and so the system is as you, behaves as you expect, right? Um, and we take a lot of measurements. We're taking a reading every six minutes, and you might say, gosh, Gabe, that seems like you're doing that a lot. And this is done uh, by automated uh, measuring equipment. It's not us out there taking samples. Um, but if you look at one of these spikes, you know, there's only about three six-minute samples in the top part of the spike. And if we were sampling every half hour, we'd probably miss that completely. So this high frequency measurement is actually necessary. Um, before after results here, it's similar at this much larger scale. Uh, and now notice that instead of 80, we have 80 hundreds or 8,000. Um, Pre-implementation, a lot of water flowing downstream and uh, post-implementation, much less. And the same was true in both Chapel, sorry, and in Elm Street. Sim sim very similar results. A lot of water being diverted, uh, great success. Um, and the reason it's a success is what Giovanni mentioned, is that we have these very porous soils. Uh, this is, we, at, for the downtown um, uh, 54 that, that we actually did the measurements of, the infiltration is very high. He mentioned, you know, numbers that could be over 160. Um, and our average, the average of all of our sites was above 40 
inches per hour, which is fantastic infiltration rates, and it means that uh, a relatively small bioswale can capture a lot of water. Um, the systems are similar, um, but not identical. So, um, to summarize some of the conclu conclusions and take home messages from the monitoring work, uh, one is that there's a very large reduction in the amount of water that is going downstream and could, could cause flooding, um, and likewise an improvement in water quality that's associated with that. Um, second point, the third point, um, and something that we, we haven't talked about, but maintaining this is very important. Of course, maintaining any kind of stormwater infrastructure is important, but often it's below ground and you don't see it. These, they're at, it's at the surface, so you notice when it might need to be cleaned out from either uh, anthropogenic litter or litter like leaves. Um, very in high infiltration rates. Um, mon it turns out that monitoring these individual systems was harder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, but these guys are likely to reduce New Haven's downtown flooding problems, so that's all great. Um, thank yous to everybody, um, URI, uh, Chris and Matt, who were, did a lot of the design and building uh, in conjunction with the engineers, students, uh, Don and Giovanni, and the residents of New Haven who did not vandalize my equipment and in general were very curious and excited by uh, what they were seeing. Um, so there's this picture of me, and you might wonder, what happens when you get down below the street surface? What's down there? Turns out that there's a huge party going on. <laughs> so do you have any questions for either of us? Yeah, we're going to ask you. you to use a microphone because today's lecture is being recorded. And so for the people who are um, on the webinar, they can hear the questions. Anybody have any questions? Okay, I missed the point about the copper. You said 89% was eliminated, and then you dropped back down. You said 15%, so I, I didn't understand. Okay, why are those two numbers disparate? The, the, say yes. again? Why are the two numbers different? Well, the first one represents the difference if you go to the ends of the watershed and look at the, wa the, the, the copper that's leaving the system. Okay. The smaller difference is if you're looking from the gutter to the bottom of a single bioswale, right? So the greater distance it's traveling, it's losing metals, it's going further away? Is That's that part of it, but you're also eliminating water. Remember how much water oh, is right. being... Okay. And my second question was about the daisy. You said that the one was very discrepant from the other two, yeah. and it's difficult to measure. Was it the designs were identical, or what was the issue there? Well, Giovanni has an idea. Yeah, I mean, I think... Good. Uh, I, I think what you see in that area there is that the, the entire complex that is uh, sort of on the northern side of that, I think that entire complex actually drains into that half of the watershed. So these, all of those red, red roofs. roofs go into there. So the ratio of the area of the street to the, to the ratio of the roof uh, is a lot smaller. So while in the other two watersheds, your signal is basically from the streets and from the bioswales, uh, m most of the water in that third one is actually coming from the roofs and it's not controlled at all by our bioswales. So the, the signal from our bioswales, so to speak, is completely drowned out. Yeah, so we, we assume that the, these roofs are draining into this uh, watershed. It's quite likely that they're actually being carried by a pipe into this other one. And by not taking it into account, we get this discrepant result. Um, by the way, do you have to irrigate at all during the year? No. No, never. We don't. Okay. We, we, put, we select the plants that are hardy, um, and uh, it's probably far less expensive for us to go through and replace the occasional plant than to uh, hire someone to irrigate. But usually New Haven has enough water that, uh, especially once the plants have developed, um, you know, they, they, they usually can survive a dry spell. You, you are limited because you have to have plants that can withstand these extended dry periods, but then can also be completely inundated and, 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 and not get drowned by it. So and also have to be salt tolerant. Uh, yeah, Gabe, I'm wondering if you can dig in a bit more on the sites that uh, saw the increase in nitrogen and if that like, would give you any like, reason to pause or caveats for other municipalities that might be trying to adopt this for like, a water quality uh, 
primary, primary Yeah, goal? The, the limited research that I've seen, uh, other people are finding uh, a similar result that nitrogen is not consistently in one direction. However, uh, we are also looking at individual storms there and not the aggregate over the entire year, which we haven't done yet and in fact don't yet have data that would allow us to do that. At the same time, what I'm showing you there is differences between the street and the bottom of the bioswale. Because we're removing a lot of water, all of the nitrogen that's in that water is being passed through the soils and is probably getting eliminated. So it's, it's a better um, result than maybe that slide would suggest. <coughs> but that's certainly an, an, area, an important area of future research. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I just have a, uh, this seems like a fairly mature project. And, but I'm not sure, and so I'm curious what would be on deck, you know, following up. Does this project have a lot farther to go, or is there something else coming up? Well, at the moment, uh, I'm in the process of writing a proposal to look at a suburban rather than an urban uh, system. Um, but um, I... Which, you know, I mean, the pattern, would, the, the pattern of the research would be very similar and just kind of the setting would be different. And, and you know, people who, lawns, they use a lot of fertilizers and pesticides, actually a lot more than typically than in agriculture. And so there's been a lot of studies showing that that can be a major problem and something that probably the signal is, is not so high in New Haven where we have small lots or just downtown urban areas where there's no uh, lawn chemicals used at all. And I'll just add, we started this in 2014, so it's it's actually been this research started on West Park quite a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question here. Can passers-by be of any help in the maintenance? Because sometimes I pass these bioswales and I see, you know, trash in there, and I'm thinking. Should I try to take it out? Yes, If I please. put my foot in there, will it hurt <laughs> yeah. the bioswale? Yeah, we're, we're not going to complain, that's for sure. We'd be very grateful to you. Uh, there are plenty of bioswales that people have sort of adopted as well um, and that are maintained. We actually are now this year, this season, because we have enough of them, we actually are writing the contract out of our stormwater maintenance to do you know three or four cleanings a year. Uh, but that's sort of the backstop, and we'd really like to see people adopt them uh, and have seen that. Uh, Yale University tends to do a lot of maintenance on them right before commencement, um, as you can imagine. Um, not so much the rest of the year, I think. But uh, so, yes, please. No. No, they're... They're very resilient systems. They're meant to be uh, kind of abused there. And the, the Gabion system in particular uh, covers up for a lot of sins because it allows the water to get down uh, pretty easily. I'll just add the most helpful is removing trash and leaves because that's really what blocks them the most. Um, and uh, the most complicated is really the grading of them. But right. Anecdotally, the only exception to that was one time we were doing some research on anthropogenic litter, and we one day I went out and laid out plots that students were supposed to come to the next day and pick the litter and, and you know uh, measure it. And instead, what happened was a a well wisher came and cleaned the plots for us in advance. So that was a big shock. That's very unusual, though, and pretty much whenever you see litter in these things, take it. So is there any potential danger of putting too much water into the ground underneath New Haven? Well, we're, if you put 100% in, it would be back to where we were in, you know, 1602 or something, and the, the landscape was perfectly happy with that. So the, the short answer is no, there's no danger. Yeah, and the, the quantity, the volumes that you're dealing with compared to the volumes, you know, across the city of rain and stuff like that still tend to be pretty small. Um, New York City has done a bunch of work on the, the spacing difference, uh, spacing between buildings and bioswales. Uh, basically, once you start getting within five feet, that tends to be a problem. We are at least 10 feet away. Uh, we haven't had anyone complain that suddenly they have water pouring into their basement or anything like that. Um, also, New Haven's very high infiltration rate means that sort of the cone of how the water spreads out is actually pretty steeply sloped. So the, the foundations really don't impinge on that cone of water that seeps out the bottom of the bioswales. 
Um, I have two questions. How does the cistern collect water? And then the other question was, I, I recall um, several years ago you mentioned that the f top two inches of the soil trapped most of the pollutants. Um, is that still true? A uh, cistern collects water typically through a catch basin or some type of inlet grate. So in other words, the water's flowing down the street, goes into the catch basin, and then instead of going into a pipe off someplace else, it's diverted into the cistern, which is right next to it. And these things are big. They're the, the ones that we were looking at. You saw Kelsey climbing out of one of them. They're uh, 10 feet deep, I think, and 8 feet in diameter. Right. So, so those are the big ones. Some other ones we have actually just look like a catch basin, except it doesn't connect to anything. It has simply a 2-foot pipe that goes down about 9 or 10 feet. Uh, and then it's surrounded by stone, and that just infiltrates in. Uh, the city has built all of them, yeah. We, we didn't build them specifically for this project, and we've built them in various spots where we can't fit biosoils. Uh, going forward in the future, are you planning to put in more bioswales in New Haven? Yes. That's, it's part and parcel of what we do for stormwater management in the city. We've got 204. Mm -hmm. At this point, we've got probably another uh, 70 or 80 on tap for this year. Um, and they're just really part of our, our projects now. They're not a specific project. Like we did a traffic calming project on Clinton Avenue, and it was a lot more cost effective for us to put in bioswales than to do a lot of uh, new catch basins and plumbing and a lot heavier uh, touch infrastructure there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really just part of what we do. Um, you know, Aaron Good, who's actually sitting in the back here, did a calculation that we're almost at the per capita level of Portland, Oregon. Um, and I think this, <laughs> this year we might pass them, depending on what their construction schedule looks like. But, um, you know, it's something that's working. Uh, and I want to say thank you so much to Dr. Benoit and others who have looked at it. Um, and it's also cost effective for the city, which is very important these days. Okay. Last question. <laughs> Um, so I have a student who's looking at like different things you can add to the bioswale medium, basically like slag or other things that might be doing physical capture of some of these metals or other things. I'm just wondering if you're building that into the design in New Haven, like trying different mixes and then looking at nutrient or metal capture through different media. No, but we'd love to work with you on that if you're interested. Yeah, I mean, one, th one thing that's often used for water purification is activated carbon, and that's, I can imagine, a layer of that. They, they do actually have inserts that go into uh, catch basins that would contain materials like that, but no reason it couldn't go into a bioswale, too. Okay, I think we have to take our last question and give up the room, but there's one more in the back. Um, I was curious if there's any correlation between the, your other project with this tree tree planting um, and survivability in relation to the amount of water that's being captured, especially since there's so much, the infil infiltration rate is so high in New Haven? Yeah, you take that. Um, we haven't studied that at all, and I don't think that there is any direct relationship because, uh, number one, the, the bioswales aren't cited um, based on the location of newly planted street trees. In fact, one of the things that we look for when we are siting is a distance from a large tree because we don't want to disrupt the rooting system. When you're doing the excavation for a bioswale, you're digging down five feet. So you could adversely affect a large street tree. Um, so the street tree program we do check survival one year out, two years out, and five years out, and it's very high. It's over 90% but it's not related to the bioswales. At the same time, all that water that's going in the bioswales is getting into the subsurface where roots could take it up, uh, potentially at least. So we just haven't studied that relationship. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Which is a good, it's a good segue um, to say that we have you all sign in. From, I don't know if everybody got this clipboard that's going around, but it's helpful for us to know how many came and how you heard about us. Um, and if you want to get on our mailing list to hear about other events that are coming up. We also, are planting trees and it's our tree planting season starting the end of March so if you live in New Haven or work in New Haven and have a location New Haven location for a tree and want to sign up there's a sign up here in the back um, in the back of the room can you all help me thank Giovanni and Gabe <laughs>